Our final solo presenter this morning is Sue Ujiri, Executive Director of Defending Rights and Dissent with an extensive career of advocating for peace, civil rights, and economic justice. Her talk is titled, The Clear and Present Danger, Attacks on the Right to Dissent 2018. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. I, while, um, while you were speaking, I snuck on the website to make sure if any of my board members had been ever awarded the, the Debs Award. Victor Navasky, who's been on my board for, I don't know, since before I was born, um, did win in 1996. So that's pretty cool. We're connected. Um, so uh, away from electoral politics and back out into the streets, um, on one October morning in 1960, the New York Times reported on the founding of a civil liberties group, announcing that it was infested with communists. That was my organization, then known as NACA HUAC, the National Committee to Abolish HUAC, which you all know what HUAC is, right? House Un-American Activities Committee. Um, they knew the source of that article. It was fed to, um, to the Times by the FBI. Um, which was hell-bent on defaming the activists who were organizing NACAHUAC, which included um, Frank Wilkinson, Dick Criley, Ann and Carl Braden, among others. And we know that um, from the FBI's 231,000-page file on Frank Wilkinson that we liberated through FOIA in the 1980s. Has anybody here ever heard of Frank Wilkinson? 231,000 pages the FBI collected on him. They tailed him day and night for years. Um, so for me, from my background, my starting point on repression is always the FBI. They're equipped, they have the budget, they have the authorities, and they have the um, motivation to disrupt any social movement that gains momentum in the country. During the COINTELPRO era, the agency had just a fraction of the budget and the number of agents that it has now. Um, remember when we used to joke that the only people left in the Communist Party were the FBI informants? Well, back then, the FBI had about 1,500 confidential human sources. Today, they have 15,000. And the rules that guide them are almost as loose as um, back before the church committee instituted those, their reforms. The reforms have been decimated. Um, so if we just look um, at what those 15,000 paid informants are allowed to do, pretty much anything. They can infiltrate any religious or political group that they want to. They can foment distrust. They can goad and encourage activists to unlawful behavior. They can uh, provide the means for any unlawful behavior. Um, and they've done that, and they'll continue to do it because it works. Um, we have a comic book that I was handing out yesterday, and I've got more copies today if you haven't seen it, that talks about two particular cases of FBI entrapment in the past decade, um, where informants were sent in first to an uh, economically depressed community in Newburgh, New York, um, and they targeted um, four, young, four, four men who were destitute, four Muslim, black Muslim men, um, the, the um, FBI informant, named Hussein, was paid $96,000 to spend about a year in the community of Newburgh um, providing um, money and jobs to these um, men without means and goading them on to join him in a terrorist attack where he provided all the means um, to, to pull off the terrorist attack. The other case is the FBI's um, entrapment of Cleveland Occupy activists, um, four young men who were uh, targeted and the same same thing for young men who had come to occupy Cleveland um, to find meaning and purpose for their lives at about the same age that say Brett Kavanaugh was drinking and raping women um, they came to occupy Cleveland they found meaning they also found um, an FBI informant who befriended them became a father figure gave them jobs gave them drugs gave them alcohol um, set them up with arms dealers um, and uh, and kind of led them along a plot to, um, to explode a bridge in Cleveland, um, thereby really, um, this was just after the winter um, and Occupy had kind of been in a, a 
a kind of um, hibernation, I guess, and was ready to spring out on May Day. But the, the plot against Occupy Cleveland kind of um, torpedoed the Occupy movement. That's the FBI. Um, one last thing to say about the FBI. Have people here heard about the Black Identity Extremism Report? Um, this is an a, a, um, intelligence assessment that the FBI wrote that was leaked last year to Foreign Policy magazine. And what the report did was link six utterly unrelated individual violent attacks by black men on police perpetrated over three years. Um, they linked the, tried to link them together in this report in order to conjure up a heretofore unrecognized movement or ideology that it calls black identity extremist. And the report asser asserts that there is, quote, a resurgence in ideologically motivated violent criminal activity within the BIE movement. What the hell is the BIE movement? It's not a thing. Um, so the report is erroneous. It's biased. It conflates violence with political activism. It marginalizes and chills dissenting voices. And it lays the foundation for local and federal law enforcement to justify crackdowns against peaceful racial justice activists and to infiltrate those movements, particularly the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, we do know that local police um, are getting training um, around the country in identifying these BIE threats. Um, so this brings me to another, um, another program that's um, severely repressive. It's called the Countering Violent Extremism Program, which was launched by the Obama administration as kind of your kinder, gentler um, counterterrorism program. Um, it's promoted around the country as building community resilience against violent extremism, and it's sold as a social service program to help communities at risk of violent extremism, aka Muslims. Um, the way, in theory, the program um, addresses all forms of this thing, violent extremism, um, including your animal rights violent extremists, your environmental violent extremists, your anarchist violent, violent extremists, your um, anti-fascists, um, and uh, also your white supremacists, your um, sovereign citizens, your white nationalists. Um, and what, what the program does is deputize teachers, healthcare professionals, social workers, faith leaders, and other trusted community members to act as informants um, to, by training them to identify these potential terrorists based on an utterly debunked theory of kind of a conveyor belt to radicalization. Um, so these community members will be taught to identify young people who might be susceptible to violent extremism um, it, by, for example, they'll be susceptible to um, uh, Islamic radicalization if they become more religious, if they grow a beard, if they cut off their beard. <laughs> um, it's it's wildly unscientific, um, and what it, and it's uh, basically thought policing, social control, profiling, and surveillance of communities all wrapped into one. Um, it doesn't come to your community generally called the program on countering violent extremism. It'll have a um, it'll have a, a friendly name like um, oh, I'm sorry I can't I'm totally spacing out right now on, on what the what the names are called. When I think of it, I'll tell you. But you need to be on the lookout because this is nonprofits get grants from the Department of Homeland Security. They'll work with police. They'll work with the U.S. Attorney's Office, um, and they'll preach preach this. Um, this program through community education forums. I was actually at one a couple months ago in Washington that was presented um, at our local police station by the U.S. Attorney's Office um, and uh, by, um, by the Ombudsman of the U.S. Attorney's Office, an African-American woman, and she included in her presentation um, teaching us how to identify black identity extremists. The pushback was enormous, but she was like, oh, well, I don't want a young man who sees the police kill somebody. I don't want them to turn into a black identity extremist, so therefore I need to teach you about this. And I'm like, why don't you teach the police how to not shoot unarmed black men? Anyways, this is... Um, um, 
So, so that's, a, that's a serious concern, particularly within the Muslim community, as the, as the program is right now very much targeted at, at Muslim communities, particularly in Boston, Minneapolis, and Los, An Los Angeles, but around the, around the country. Um, and actually around the world. It's, a, it's, a, um, it's, it's where all the money is for doing um, countering uh, uh, counterterrorism work right now. Um, but uh, the, the other big, the big threat against dissent that we talked about a little bit yesterday is the state bills that are popping up around the country that are designed to, to really create fear and confusion and suppress dissent. We've seen over 60 bills introduced by lawmakers since 2016 that pretty much escalate penalties for protesters. And the most egregious measure, measures that have passed, or what I think are the most egregious, measures that have been passed were, um, and we talked about this a little bit yesterday in Louisiana, a new, quote, critical infrastructure law that makes it a felony with up to five years in prison for unauthorized entry into a pipeline site. It's strikingly similar to a model bill proposed by ALEC and, um, and, and other, other bills around the country backed by energy companies that have been recently adopted in Oklahoma and Iowa and that are under consideration here in Ohio and also in Pennsylvania. Um, and then, of course, in North Dakota, in the wake of the Standing Rock, Standing Rock demonstrations, um, the state passed several new laws to, um, to increase sanction for, um, for protesters um, by increasing penalties and broadening the definition of what a riot is and criminal trespass. And they have another law that targets protesters wearing masks, hoods, or face coverings. Um, during the North Dakota winters, nobody wants to wear a mask or a hood. Um, so, and then in Missouri, it's interesting because you know that they just defeated the right to, the right to work ballot initiative, but lawmakers have um, already passed, had previously passed, um, a law that places arbitrary restrictions on public employee unions and prohibits labor agreements from allowing any kind of striking or picketing. Um, and then there are also across the country a wave of bills that target specifically the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, um, laws or executive orders that have been passed in 25 states, including here in Ohio, as well as New York, California, Texas, and Florida. And what's notable about those bills is that they are very bipartisan. Um, so it's not a coincidence that these reactionary bills come amid a revival of disruptive but nonviolent protests across the U.S. Um, precisely because these bills are aimed at those movements. Um, local activists have been successful in defeating the majority of these draconian bills, including ones in Arizona, New Jersey, North Carolina, Georgia, Oregon, and Wisconsin that would have expanded the definition of riot or domestic terrorism to include protest activities. Um, but several states and Congress are still considering measures that would turn acts of civil disobedience like trespass into felonies with serious consequences. So the bills fall into a few different buckets. Um, one bucket um, we call the face covering bills. Um, in Congress, there's a bill called the Unmask Antifa Act of 2018 that would make it a federal crime to wear a mask or other disguise while protesting or threatening um, protesting in a threatening or intimidating way. And there's a bill here in Ohio um, that's been introduced that would create the crime of masked intimidation uh, by broadly prohibiting the wearing of masks or other disguises in certain circumstances during protests, subject up to six months in jail and a thousand dollar fine. Um, what's tricky about these is that they're modeled along bills that were passed in the last century that were aimed at the Klan. So it's a it's a um, it's it's a it's it's a strange <laughs> a strange juxtaposition. Um, because these bills that are being introduced now are very much aimed at anarchists and anti-fascist protesters. Um, another bucket is the kind of general protest as crime bills. And there's a bill in Virginia that would allow state officials to designate groups as domestic terrorist organizations, members that of that designated group from meeting um, in groups of three or more people. 
Um, in Pennsylvania, there's a bill that would permit local authorities to seek restitution from protesters convicted of a misdemeanor or felony in the course of a protest or demonstration, including paying overtime of law enforcement. Um, and that's a common thing that we're seeing right now is attempts to get protesters to pay for, um, for, for the policing of their protests. Um, in Massachusetts, there's a law that sets harsh new penalties for individuals who impede traffic in the course of a protest or demonstration, um, including up to $5,000 fine and a year in jail. There was a, a spate of these types of bills, the um, you can't block traffic bills, um, that popped up after, um, after so many of the Black Lives Matter protests took to the highways and streets. Um, so clearly aimed at, the, at that genre of protest. Um, and then there are the corporate-backed infrastructure bills that, that we are dealing with here in Ohio. The Ohio bill would increase the penalties for protests near oil and gas pipelines by expanding the definition of criminal trespass and criminal mischief. And the bill also imposes fines on the organizations that are found to be complicit in the trespass, trespass or mischief offense. So this is a new thing where they're um, kind of trying to, trying to basically weaken the environmental movement by, by crush, imposing crushing fines and penalties on your Greenpeace, your Sierra Club, and stuff like that, or just try to get them to not help support the local protests because they could, get, um, they could be found complicit. Um, in Pennsylvania, there's a critical infrastructure bill that makes it a felony to trespass in a, quote, critical infrastructure facility. Um, which is broadly defined to include natural gas facilities and pipelines. And that's what all these critical infrastructure bills do. They specifically um, call out the, um, they specifically protect pipelines and energy infrastructure. Another big bucket that we're very worried about are the campus free speech bills, um, which are aimed at protecting the speech of the powerful and penalizing the speech of the unpowerful. Um, it's generally, it, they're, they're aimed at uh, state universities um, because they can't, they can't be aimed at private college campuses. Um, but they're doing this themselves, the private college campuses. Don't worry, they're crushing speech. Um, in Illinois and in Michigan, um, they, there are bills that would create mandatory penalties that could be applied to peaceful protesters on college and university campuses if they in any way impede the, the speech of an invited uh, right-wing speaker. Um, we also have the anti-BDS bills, um, which are another broad bucket. Those are, uh, they're, they're a little bit different because they're not aimed at street protests, they're aimed at the protest of boycotts um, and generally um, kind of work behind the scenes to deny state contracts to any company um, or group or organization that would dare to boycott Israel. Um, but even, even without these new laws, um, so, so Defending Rights and Dissent, I should say, is, is part of a national coalition that's working to um, shore up local, pro, lo, local activists who are fighting these anti-protest laws. They're, they're imposed at the state level. They need to be fought at the state level. But our hope is that national organizations can provide resources and talking points and, and gin up our supporters in any given state to help fight these bills. Um, while keeping a low profile because, um, for example, in um, Louisiana, it really doesn't help to have Greenpeace and, um, and the ACLU be fighting a bill because Louisiana doesn't give a damn what <laughs> Greenpeace and the ACLU think. Um, but even without these bills passing or, or becoming law, um, the powers that be still have ample tools to crush protest. Um, there's, a, in, in addition to the FBI and the Countering Violent Extremism Program, local police have, um, have, their, the, have become heavily militarized, and their, um, their response of choice to protest is a, is a militarized um, is a militarized response where they come out in riot gear with their um, excess military equipment that they've gotten from the Pentagon. And it's not that this is new. We know that, um, that uh, protests have been violently crushed uh, 
throughout the history of the United States. You just go back every um, you know, every generation, and there's and there's an example of the way police have crushed protest from uh, the civil rights movement. Um, it's the 50th anniversary of of 68, so we're seeing a lot of images of Chicago on TV. We know that. Um, that police have never been gentle with protesters. And if you look back to the late 19th and early, early 20th century, the way that unions strikes were crushed, um, I think that's kind of the, maybe that's the height of, of, um, of violence against protests. Um, so, but what police militarization does is allow, obviously, the massive disproportionate force to be used against protesters in shocking ways, and that's obviously repressive, but what it also does is provide a two-way communicative value. It communicates a message to protesters to intimidate them and keep, keep um, all but the most um, dedicated away from the protest, but it also communicates a message about the protesters that they're dangerous, that they're scary. Um, and, and this is a theme that we see over and over again is the attempt to demonize protesters. Um, one of the other techniques that's, that's used a lot and that was, um, I think, most recently used at the Inauguration Day protests in Washington um, at the inauguration last year um, is mass arrests and kettling. So we saw mass arrests at Standing Rock um, and in Washington and in Ferguson. Um, it's not a new tactic. It's been going back for years at IMF protests, World Bank, um, you know, the battle for Seattle. Um, we saw it during Occupy. It's been standard procedure at all the National Party conventions going back for years. Um, but mass arrests are uh, and kettling are unconstitutional. It violates the Fourth Amendment. There's no individualized suspicion. And a lot of people just kind of chalk this up to lazy police work. Oh, it's like, let's just round them all up and protest them. But uh, we should consider that it's intentional and it's also meant to demonstrate that protesters, it's meant to intimidate protesters and it's also meant to show the public that these protesters are dangerous and that's why so many of them need to be arrested. Um, of course, we have the infiltration and surveillance of protesters. We know the FBI infiltrated Occupy and Black Lives Matter, and it's certainly infiltrating some group now, and we'll find about it in four years. Um, but there's also high-tech surveillance that's going on at protests, and we've seen it over and over again in the past decade. Um, we know that the city of Chicago wants drones so that they can monitor protests. We know that Baltimore used its spy plane um, to fly over the city during the Freddie Gray uprising, and we know that Stingray devices, which are these um, mock cell phones that allow police to um, figure out who's in the area and also in some cases collect cell phone communications. And those have been used in, during protests in several cities around the country. We're still trying to dig out um, how often they've been used and where. And we're also seeing the targeting of journalists. Over and over again, journalists are being arrested while covering protests. Maybe the most high profile um, was when Amy Goodman was arrested, and now I can't even remember which protest that was at. Um, but we've also seen, was that Standing Rock? Um, sorry? Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah. Um, but we've seen kind of this argument over whether bloggers are, are journalists and they get, they get arrested and in both uh, Standing Rock and um, the J20, the Inauguration Day protest, we've seen them, uh, we've seen prosecutors attempt to prosecute journalists for felony rioting um, ju and just for uh, covering a protest. So just two other quick things I want to um, touch on are the private corporations and hit groups that are undermining protest movements or attempting to undermine protest movements. We, of course, have ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, that's, that's um, drawing up model legislation for states to, to undercut protests. We see corporations um, uh, uh, initiating slap suits against, right now, environmental groups trying to drive them bankrupt. We see Canary Mission, which is a, a website that um, identifies student activists in the um, pro-Palestine pro human rights student activists. We see Project Veritas, which is this video um, outfit that um, tries to capture progressive activists in, unflattering, in an unflattering light, and they just recently 
published a video that was their undercover operation aimed at the uh, DC DSA chapter, um, which we know contributed to the firing of a, a, a DSA activist who was a paralegal at the Department of Justice. Um, so we also, and we also know that the prosecutors in the inauguration day protests in DC worked closely with Project Veritas and got evidence from Project Veritas to, to try to prosecute the, um, the protesters. Um, and then there's Russiagate, which is impacting the progressive movement in so many different ways. Um, it's, it's the new McCarthyism. Um, it's being used to try to discredit any sort of social movement, uh, most prominently, I think, Black Lives Matter in particular, um, because it's the Russians that are sowing uh, racial discord in our country. So, um, and then this summer, um, uh, and, and so, so the way that Russiagate is, it's out there in the zeitgeist, of course, but it's also very particularly aimed at social media companies, and they are responding to it in a, in a very, um, in a very dangerous way because I think their motivation is that they don't want Congress to, to start regulating them, so they're kind of overcompensating right now um, to, to, to say, oh yeah, we're crushing all the, all the Russian influence on our pages. So Facebook this summer took down the primary organizing page that progressive activists in DC were using to organize against the Unite the Right rally. Um, they took it down because Facebook said that they found one of the um, one of the um, sponsors of the page had a IP address in Russia. Um, and then as well, um, in our own case, Facebook wouldn't allow the promotion of the ads like the Deb Centennial ad because it had political content that was of national importance. So we're seeing that over and over again, that Facebook is making um, progressive groups jump through hoops in order to prove that they're not Russian um, agitators. Um, in a very troubling way, and I'd love to talk more about that, but I know my time's up, and um, thanks very much, and make sure to ask me if you want a copy of our awesome comic book.